ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear friends from the great wine capitals, a very warm welcome from the heart of the old town of Mainz, from the cultural center, the Frankfurter Hof. In this unique setting, a historic place with a modern infrastructure, we invite you to follow us into the future of wine tourism. After many months of shutdowns and difficulties due to strict COVID regulations, fortunately, the world is slowly returning to normality. People are starting traveling again, and we are more than happy that our annual conference of the Great Wine Capital's Global Network is taking place. We have gathered here in Germany's Great Wine Capital Mines with its region Rheinhessen, Germany's biggest wine-growing region, which has been part of this network of excellence since 28. Here at the Frankfurter Hof, we are welcoming our delegates from the 11 great wine capitals of the world. Adelaide, Bilbao Rioja, Bordeaux, Cape Town, Lausanne, Mainz, Mendoza, Porto, San Francisco and the Napa Valley, Valparaiso and Verona. And we also send a warm welcome to you on the screen. Herzlich willkommen in Mainz. We will start this morning with words from Manuela Matz, Mayor of Economy, Tourism and Congresses and Wine of the City of Mainz. Dear Manuela, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Erika. Yeah, dear President Foron, dear Ms. Reule, dear Mr. Kuckerman, dear Professor Schulz, dear Great Wine Capital Fellows, some attending in person and others tuning in from all over the world of wine. A late good evening or an early good morning to all of you on the screens. We've already reached the final day of our annual conference. It's hard to believe that something that took so long to arrange and this year's event was even rearranged a few times due to COVID-19, can come to an end and so quickly. I hope you've all enjoyed the past few days in Mainz and Rheinhessen. However, it's not quite over yet. After all, we are about to start a day full of ideas that will once again prove the great value and profitability of our interactions within the Great Rhine Capitals Network. To be honest, That's my favorite topic, because we have a chance to get a glance into the future. I'm delighted to welcome renowned speaker to today's Think Tank conference, where we'll be discussing future issues in wine tourism and the wine industry. Dear Monika Reule, dear Jeremy Kuckeman, dear Professor Schulz, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for enriching the annual conference with your input. I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas and, of course, to attending the Q&A sessions. I don't want to reveal any more spoilers, so I hope everyone has an inspiring morning. Thank you very much. So now we will start our Think Tank conference with an input by Mrs. Monika Reule. CEO of the German Wine Institute that is located here in Rheinhessen, um, nearby Mainz in Bodenheim, our German great wine capital region. Monika Reule is a member of the board of the Deutsche Wein Fonds and managing director of the German Wine Institute. So she is in charge of the generic marketing of German wine here and abroad. Monika, it's your turn. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Mrs. Hellein. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to present um, some new approaches in wine tourism during your annual conference of the great wine capitals. So I will begin my presentation with a very, very brief overview of the German Wine Institute 
its objectives and tasks, followed by some facts about wine tourism in Germany. Then I will speak about some new activities to promote wine tourism in Germany. And finally, I will show you how we use virtual reality in promoting wine tourism. The German Wine Institute is the central marketing organization of the whole German wine business, meaning uh, wineries as well as cooperatives and uh, the big bottlers. Um, and um, uh, our ma main task is to promote the quality and the sales of wines from all German wine green growing regions. And we do that by generic mar marketing, um, working independently without favoring any particular products or companies. Our core activities are listed here. I won't read that all for you. I think what's important to know is that many, many market research studies have shown that people always develop a deep bond to our wines and regions once they had the opportunity to visit our regions and to speak to our wine producers. That's one of our strategic aims, is to promote wine tourism, to bring even more people to our wine regions. Currently, we are wor working in 16 different countries, uh, six, uh, 15 uh, foreign countries and Germany, and we have our own representatives in all these countries. They support our exporting producers as well as the importers of German wines in their respective countries. Our headquarter, with nearly 50 um, uh, employees, uh, Ms. Hellein already said that, is based in Bodenheim near Mainz, and we are also part of the great wine capital, Germany. Germany has 13 wine growing regions, mostly situated in, nor in the northwestern part of the country, with two exceptions, Sachsen and Saale Unstrut, located in the eastern part of Germany. And if you are not quite sure where we are today, uh, we are exactly in the center of all wine growing regions and therefore have deserved being Germany's wine capital and being part of the GWC network. Since the beginning of promoting wine tourism, we always talked about the importance of the sector for all 13 wine growing regions. However, we never had reliable data concerning the economic impact. That's why we asked Professor Solnocki from the Hochschule Geisenheim University in 2018 to do a research on that topic. Together with his assistant, Maximilian Tafel, he developed a model to, Im to assess the economic impact of wine tourism in Germany. Over 4,500 tourists in all 13 German wine growing regions were asked and provided information about their travel behavior, expenditures, and social demographic characteristics. In the end, the key findings were the following. Tourists spend approximately 50 million visiting days in Germany and spend 5.5 billion euros each year. This generates an income for over 70,000 people and the right investments could help balance regional economic disparities and achieve sustainable tourism development in the country. Wine tourism also benefits from some travel, some trends in travel behavior. A long-term travel analysis which was prepared before corona shows that there is a trend towards shorter but more frequent trips. 75% of the short vacation trips take place in Germany. Germany's popularity as a travel destination for foreign guests continues to grow. And the demographic development in Germany is in favor of wine tourism in Germany because elder people tend to stay in their own country and spend a lot of money. And frankly, the pandemic uh, was like a booster for that last trend. For instance, producers from the Mosul regions reported they, that they were almost flooded by tourists last summer. 
What are our conclusions from all this information? The subject of wine tourism has great potential in all regions. We have to bring more people from home and abroad to our wine regions. We have to create more attractive and highly quality wine experiences in the regions, and wine tastings are often no longer enough as a single wine experience. Tourists and potential new customers are looking for attractions that offer added value. So, what have we recently done to face these challenges? Uh, in the last time, uh, we awarded landmarks of wine culture and beautiful vantage points in the wine regions to create new, attractive places to go for tourists. We created also a modern wine app with a lot of information about the regions, touristic highlights, activities and events in the regions, as well as a database to locate producers. So far, it, unfortunately, it's only in German, but we are working on an English version. We also created the wine tour. This is the first and only wine and travel fair in Germany where producers present their wines and people from, from the tourism sector present their respective offers. We normally have, as you can see on the pictures, over 4,000 visitors during two days on one weekend. When the pandemic started, and put everything on hold, we started to discuss about an online version very early, uh, but we were really not sure if it could work and would be successful. However, fortunately, it was successful, and now we are already will have the third virtual wine tour starting next weekend. Um, what is the concept behind that virtual wine tour? We will offer 22 topical tastings with each wines, which, which four wines each from a total of 88 uh, wine producers. We will sell up to 4,000 wine packages in advance with four normal bottles and four mini bottles for the tasting and a catalog where, with, with other wines from the producers. We will have 60 minutes online li live wine tastings with experts and the producers. And uh, we will also address touristic highlights. Um, we will show a lot of pictures and, uh, um, of the regions of the wine and the wineries. We interact with the participants via a game app. We ask the participants uh, certain questions. They can vote per, per smartphone mobile, and all tasting will be recorded and mail, made available in a library so that people who have bought a package but were unable to attend the live tasting can organize their own wine tasting and watch the recording. In 2016, we decided to use virtual reality to promote wine tourism. The reason for this was that we noticed that many people who do not live in the wine regions um, or not able to, uh, to visit a wine region do not know how beautiful our regions are. So we get, wanted to give these people the opportunity to immerse themselves into an artificial world of wine ex and explore it. Therefore, we shot our first virtual reality film in 2017 with a real winemaker couple who takes us to their vineyards and their wine cellars. With the film, we bring the wine regions and the German wine to the people without having them on site. We therefore use the film primarily at consumer events in Germany and abroad, and we combine this with the opportunity to taste German wines afterwards. What can a VR film do better than a normal film? Putting on the VR headset, you yourself gone on your virtual tour exploring vineyards in a way that almost feels real but doesn't really exist. VR gives you the impression to be part of the film. It's up to you whether you look right or left, down or up, ahead or behind you. No matter where you look, you will always discover new details. That's why it's so exciting to watch the film uh, several times. 
I don't want to hide the fact that there are some disadvantages using VR technology. The film production technically is very demanding and expensive, at least it was five years ago. You work with four different cameras. The camera main cannot stand, uh, stand behind uh, the cameras, meaning the entire filming ha film team has to hide. You always have four recordings at the same time, uh, which later have to be precisely put together. The VR equipment is very expensive and the quality is not always satisfying or it is inconvenient, as you can see here, uh, like these card box uh, headsets uh, where you clip your mobile uh, into. The film quality and the output quality often do not really match and there are incompatibilities between different systems. So if you have uh, you do, uh, watch the film with your mobile, you have to produce different versions of the film uh, according to iPhone or Android standard. But there are, all, uh, there are also many advantages. Technology arouses curiosity in many people, especially in usual places like, for example, pedestrian zones or shopping malls. The younger target groups are already very familiar with the technology. They have no reservations, uh, um, but uh, elder people, um, for, uh, for instance, often uh, are often a little bit hesitant to put on uh, the headset. Uh, the infotainment is becoming more and more important. I already said that. And people who may or may not be able to afford to travel to Germany can experience the regions and the winery on site in a very sustainable way. So you can acquire new customers simply through storytelling and without having them on site. And now I would like to present you the film. As I already told you, the quality is not optimal, and of course I do not have VR headsets for all of you here in the room or for all participants watching uh, the live stream. Um, so uh, we did a simulation and recorded the whole thing for you two days ago. Therefore, in a moment, you will follow my eye guidance, which wasn't so exciting uh, how it could have been. Unfortunately, I only noticed that afterwards and I wasn't able to, uh, to do the, sa uh, the same procedure uh, again because it's uh, really time consuming. So it's not the same uh, as if you would do it yourself, but I hope you uh, still get an, an idea and impression what is possi possible. And now let's hope that the film and the techno the film will start and the technology will work. Oh, someone's there. Hello. Nice to meet you. Just a minute, please. Just let me get out of this vineyard. It's really steep here. Well, first of all, welcome to my vineyard. My name is Lucas and I am a winemaker. We are right in the middle of Germany here. There are a total of 13 wine growing regions in Germany in great varieties such as Riesling, Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir. Here we grow Pinot Noir and we are going to harvest it today. And afterwards the grapes go straight to the winery. But first you should start by admiring the great view. Hey Lucas, the work does not do itself. You heard, I'll have to put that back down. The voice you heard up there, that was my wife. Hi, I'm Carol, and you have picked the perfect day to visit us. We are right in the middle of harvesting. We work towards this moment for the entire year. This is our absolute highlight. But wait, I've also got some pictures for you. Just a second. This one is taken in winter when the vines are still covered in snow. Then we start cultivating. It's what you see here. We are pruning the vines, and we do all of this by hand. In the end, we get a fruit-bearing cane, which needs to be tied to these two wires at the base. And here, you see a cluster as it looks in April. When you see the grapes now, all of them are wonderfully red already. We have cut off the leaves so the sun may directly hit the grapes and they can ripen well. This is very important. But it's probably best if I simply show you a bunch of grapes. Just wait a minute. 
Take this one here. It looks great. It's a beautiful bunch and it looks fantastic. It's absolutely healthy and the berries have a lovely red color. And they also taste super sweet. Now they are ready to be harvested. Once the grapes have reached this degree of sweetness, we start to hand-pick them all. This means we cut every single bunch off with grape shears. It takes a lot of us together half a day until we have harvested this entire vineyard here. We have another full container up here. <laughs> you heard it. We have to climb back up. Let's go to the winery. And what about you? You have to come along. Off we go. Feathers? Yep. Bye. And you? Come on, let's go. Have a look down here now. Take in these steep slopes. This is perfect for our grapes. The sun can shine down on them freely and the grapes can ripen really well. This will definitely result in a great wine. Okay, now we're back home at the winery. This means for our grapes that they will get processed now. Processed means we let the red grapes ferment now, skins and all, since red wine gets its color from the skins only. And the white grapes go straight into the wine press. Well, we have to continue unloading, but you might like to have a look around the cellar. Well, this is our vaulted cellar. Our grandfather already used it to ferment wine. It was built in 1870, and we try to combine traditional and modern methods in here. For us, modern means to use stainless steel. Our freshly pressed must runs down from above into the tanks down here. Then we add yeast and leave the lot to ferment at about 18 degrees. And after two weeks, we have a crisp Riesling. However, 14 days is nothing. We have our uh, here filled with last year's Pinot Noir that will stay in there for another full year until it will be bottled. Wooden casks are great. The wood breathes and the red wine gets the air but makes it mature further. It's actually still too soon to taste it now, but that won't stop me. Drawing a sample is really the best thing about being a winemaker. Oh, right. Thank you very much. The colour is great already. And so is the fragrance. Seems that our work has paid off. Lucas? Mm -hmm. I know that you really want to sample your Pinot Noir, but I, I would actually prefer a nice Riesling. White? Or maybe red. And that is the moment when you take off your headset and your, our team is standing in front of you offering you a choice of glasses of red or white wine. Where do we use this film? Since 2018, we annually organize uh, in, Germ a German, in Germany a road show in shopping malls in approximately 25 big cities outside the wine growing regions. We have a truck with all the equipment um, and a crew traveling from town to town. And in the shopping malls, we, we rent an area where we have five seats with uh, VR equipment and uh, swivel chairs so that people can experience the full 360 degree perspective. And after having seen the film, um, people have the opportunity to taste various German wines at our wine bar and get more information about Germany's wine-growing regions. 
We also present the film during our own trade events like our Riesling and Co. tasting tour in various foreign countries. Here you can see a picture from Warsaw. And we present the film during various trade and end consumer fairs in Germany and abroad like the book fair in Frankfurt or the North Sea Chess Festival in, uh, in the Netherlands or the Shanghai Wine and Dine Festival. So I hope uh, you have got an impression, uh, despite the problems with the technology, what is possible with uh, VR, and I can, can only encourage you to use that technology. The possibilities are endless. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Yeah, so thank you very much also on behalf of our organization to being here this morning. We're here in the Frankfurter Hof, the audience can see us, but you have now the possibility, those who are here with us, delegates from Europe and also one from Napa Valley, if you have any questions, we have prepared microphones and uh, you are, yeah, we invite you to ask. There's one. No? No? Don't be shy. <laughs> no one? Ah, Tom Perry. Thank you. It's going to be easy. That's good. good. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Frau Reule. It was a fantastic presentation. My question is, a lot of the measures you've put into place, you know, the virtual reality and so on and so forth, are obviously measures uh, because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, do you do you plan to continue with some of those activities when things get back to normal or more or less normal, or or will we go back to the to the more traditional ways of promoting? Thank you. Um, I think concerning the virtual re um, uh, wine tour, for example. We will um, return to, to a format where we have participants on site, but uh, we will also do a, a hybrid format so that people who can't, can't be able to, to travel to Hamburg or Munich or uh, Essen, that they can participate participate online. So we will keep some of the uh, things online while tasting will be part um, uh, in the future, I'm quite sure, uh, but uh, at, at, a, uh, um, at a less quantity, but uh, um, yeah, we will also uh, do more online communication. That's great uh, via social media and so on. We will um, develop uh, the app further so that people uh, always get uh, new information to be interesting. Uh, so it's part of both, keep going back to the normal and uh, keeping the news and new activities. And virtual reality is really, really a, a great thing for people who can't or won't travel. And that's why and you can, uh, as I said, the possibilities in endl are endless. You can also uh, show how a big bottle is working, for example, or uh, touristic highlights. We already have uh, v uh, uh, few films from uh, the German National Board of Tourism showing people who are not in Germany how beautiful Germany is and uh, to convince them to come to Germany when it's possible. Sorry, we, we give you the microphone that everybody can hear. This is a question from... Yes, when Otto. we receive visitors, yeah, it's maybe not the picking time and they would like uh, to participate. And, um, and on your film, on the video film, yeah, we can see that very well done and also it's so difficult. We also see that uh, efforts and it makes the wine even more... Um, important and precious and uh, for elder people yeah they can even even not uh, do that maybe young <laughs> not as well but that's very interesting indeed uh, and um, during um, it was on tuesday we visited papa Rhein, this big uh, complex for tourists uh, and it was very interesting too and um, 
Uh, I don't know the figures, the tourism figures in, in France, but we have the same trend uh, because of COVID, having um, the national uh, uh, people staying in their own country and discovering again their, their country. That's very, very nice. And wish you good, good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you are really right. Normally, we, we invite journalists and, and uh, people from the trade uh, during harvest time to come to Germany and to pick the grapes um, by hand themselves. And afterwards, after half a day of grape picking, people always say, oh, your wines are too cheap. Uh, said such a lot of work, I didn't know that. And therefore, you can... Uh, um, simulate uh, that with uh, a film like that and uh, that's really helpful in, in promoting in, uh, 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 the sales of wine. We had a discussion we had a discussion about wine prices yesterday and the day before in the evening with our delegates and it's very interesting because the countries are really uh, different even if we face uh, the same uh, challenges. I think there's another question from Catherine Le Parmentier. Yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your presentation that there was a study that has been run by a, a, a Professor Dol Zolnowski. Zolnowski, yes. Thank you. At Gessenheim University. Um, are some of the outcomes of this, uh, of this study um, public or is it just for your own uh, um, organization to, 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 to no. have those data? He has published the, the results uh, also in English. If you are interested, in, I can send sure. you a summary of the uh, study in English. Thank you very much. That would be really important for us. Okay, so please give me your email afterwards and I will send you the study. Or I can send it to, to Elke Hölein. Uh, yeah, and you, you can, can distribute it, it among the participants. I will participant. distribute it yes. uh, with the documents of uh, everything we will document. I think there had been another um, question from Monsieur Pesma. No? Yeah. Um, it's more a question about the, um, the activity and the mission of your organization. Uh, when it's about, you know, a, a, a national organization willing to represent the interest of the different wine regions, uh, my question is how do you make sure to keep the balance in terms of uh, representing, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a proper way all the diversity and all the wine region of Germany? Um, normally we offer everything we do, we offer all regions and it's up to the participants who like to take part in our activities if they do it or do it not. Uh, in advertising campaigns, for example, we always promote all 13 wine growing regions um, and we speak, then we speak uh, about wines of Germany, German wines in general, not of wines from Rheinhessen or wines from the Pfalz. Um, in a film like that, we are neutral. This, that was uh, produced in the Rheingau, but we don't talk about the Rheingau because it's very typical for all 13 wine growing regions. So we try to keep the balance to be new, neutral, not to favor one region, not to favor, favor uh, a certain producer or a certain wine. And all our offers are for all producers in all uh, wine growing regions, and it's up to them if they participate. So, I have a quick look at the audience. I, th I think there are no more questions for the moment, but the day will continue with new ideas and you will have the opportunity to meet Monika Reule again this evening. So, if you just feel asking her anything else, you will be more than welcome to do that. So, thank you very much thank for you. being with us and for this very interesting insight in what the German Wine Institute is doing. And now we will continue with new ideas. We welcome now Mr. Jeremy Kukieman, I would say a real celebrity in the wine world. Good morning, Jeremy. I can see you. Hi, Elke. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I think very clear. And I just would like to make a very short introduction about you as a person. You are a master of wine, one of the most prestigious distinctions in the world of wine, 
and since 2017 you are the Catch Wine School Director. So you join us now from France and I'm very happy that Technique is working so well. You are working now for nearly 15 years with more than 200 winemakers from France and abroad. And one fact I find is very inspiring and interesting is that he started his career in the wine world as a wine merchant. So he knows also the other side with boutiques in Paris and also an event agency. And as a consultant for private clients and companies in the wine industry, he writes also for many French magazines and international magazines. And you are an author of um, interesting books like Vigneron Essentiel, or um, yeah, a book that has already been awarded with several uh, literal, uh, literary prizes. And I think you just published a book, uh, Which Wines of Tomorrow? And um, we are very happy that you will give us now an insight about your thinkings, about your ideas, and how you consider the future of wine tourism. So, please, Jeremy, let us see what you will present to us. Thank you. Thanks, Elke, and, and so sorry I'm not in the room, but I'll do my best to make you feel as if I was. So let's hope technology will work. Okay. Yeah, uh, it looks good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, we you, can you see. Have, yeah. On full screen? Yeah. Full screen, almost. Yeah. But it's big. I think it's big enough. Yeah. Let me check if I can put it on full screen. Yeah. So now yeah. it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks, Elke. Obviously, uh, yeah, I will speak about wines of tomorrow. I'm I'm not a prophet. These are my projections. Uh, the good news is that I'm an optimistic person, uh, and I, as you will see, my belief is that uh, wines of tomorrow will be more sustainable, fresher, and more diverse. And I'll try to e explain why. Uh, obviously, supported by facts, figures, and trends. So. The, the first and pretty obvious question is, will wine change tomorrow? Um, the wine industry has faced many crises and is still very much alive. Uh, it has faced phylloxera, crypto, cryptogamic disease, wars, uh, financial crisis, COVID, and uh, it is still there. Um, and I believe very successful in many countries. Uh, it's facing a, a new um, um, a, a very new type of crisis with non-reversible effects, uh, climate change, uh, obviously, uh, with its uh, multiple threats and uh, an evolving demand. Uh, we'll speak about that. Anyway, uh, wine has already changed over the past decades and it will change uh, and evolve again in the near future. But my main question is, why always scaring, frightening people? Uh, changing can be for the best, and uh, I believe that for the wine industry, it will, it will be for the best. So, uh, let's start with this uh, cliché picture, I'd say. Uh, that's what we hear everywhere. Uh, we'll have winners and losers. So, basically, what we uh, can read uh, in all publications is that uh, the core cool temperate regions uh, will be the winners, uh, with obviously better or more even ripening, uh, potential for vineyard ex extension, new grape varieties, producing new styles, um, new wine producing regions, which is already the case. Um, and I would say to summarize that marginal can become classic and impossible can become possible. Uh, so that would be great for England, uh, luckily for me, uh, Germany as well. Uh, Tasmania, New Zealand, Scandinavia, and many others. But what if the AGM was taking place in Australia? And that's also what we hear. Uh, the, that's the bad part of the picture. Warm regions with very high alcohol potentials, very early harvest. Stress on the style, the identity, the grapes. Obviously, drastic adaptation strategies required and very quickly and potentially some regions not on the wine map anymore in the future. So this, this could concern Southern Rhone, the big rivers in Australia, but even McLaren Vale or the Barossa Valley, Central Spain, Duro, the Swartland, etc. 
for me, this is a cliche picture uh, because solutions and inspiration can come from the more threatened. This cliche picture only takes into account the heat, the global warming phenomenon, while it's far more complicated. So I'll share with you my vision of winners and losers. For me, the winners will be those that are the more collective, proactive, who work together, who share knowledge, who experiment and educate. And if uh, we consider uh, my uh, vision of the winners, then we have back on the map the Swartland, uh, which is working extremely proactively against uh, drought issues, uh, and, uh, and to produce very elegant wines, we have the McLaren Vale uh, and the water issue back on the map as well, because uh, they all work together to find solutions for uh, access to water and, and also for berry protection during heat waves. So uh, winners can also come from places where the impact is huge. On the other hand, losers might be those who are individual or hopeless, because obviously with that hope, there's no future. Uh, those who wait too much because there's an emergency, but in the meantime, also probably those who decide in precipitation with that consultation. So I'm thinking about those who introduce new grapes in historical uh, regions without any clue whether it will work, or invest heavily in resistant grapes when other cultures stopped long ago. Um, I'm thinking about potatoes, for instance, uh, who understood very quickly that uh, resistant um, uh, varieties uh, did not work and that the cryptogamic disease were much stronger than that. And obviously those who are not shaping the new generations. So um, back on this uh, wine map that we've all seen several times in the book, um, obviously between latitude 30 and 50, be it in the northern or southern hemisphere, uh, a map which is no longer relevant we have nowadays Norway, Brazil, high altitude in China, even Thailand producing wine, etc. So we have a new wine map, but how many historical vineyards have disappeared? Not that many. And I remember that the prediction, the first prediction was speaking about 2020. We're in 2021 and we still have a wine map that has extended, but without regions that disappeared. So this adheres to some terror because of drought, heat, extreme weather spells, no future, not sustainable. I'm, I'm not convinced, not for the moment, uh, and, uh, and probably not at least in the near future. Because this, this picture is far too simple. If, if we think about terroir, terroir is climate, but it's also soil. And when I speak about soil, it's geology, pedology, topography. It's, Grape variety or grape varieties, it's human influence, and only one component of the equation is evolving. And I'm convinced that others can adapt or mitigate, and it's already the case. If we look at this figure, which is pretty famous, and you probably have seen that in many, many uh, presentations about climate change, um, the figure on the left dates of of 2006 uh, by uh, famous climatologist Gregory Jones. And, and the figure is showing the average growing season temperature uh, for producing wine with the different and the most famous grape varieties. And if we take into account that figures, many grape varieties would not be suitable for wine production nowadays and would produce raisins only suitable for table production. If we take into account this figure, uh, then what about Malbec in, in Mendoza? It would not produce uh, good wines anymore. Uh, same for Merlot in Washington State or in Napa Valley, and I could take many other examples. So figures do not always tell us the truth when it comes to viticulture for two reasons. Vitis vinifera resilience and human resilience. And these predictions are already out of date, which I believe is very good news. If we take a step back, um, there's also an interesting question. Is it necessarily a bad news if certain wine regions disappear? We have regions in which wine production, viticulture is intensive and industrial, not very responsible, 
And we could even ask the question, are these places true wine terroirs? I'm thinking about California Central Valley, big rivers in Australia, where you find heavy irrigation and where there's not really a sense of place and there's no sustainability. So is it bad news if it concerns region in which wine production is questionable? As I said before, my belief is that wines of tomorrow will be more sustainable and more responsible. The first, the, 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 the first reason is that, well, we start warning people um, because of climate change and the market has changed. Consumer, consumers' behavior has evolved. People want to act when choosing, when purchasing wine. They, they want to be part of the environmental transition. And the market is asking for this more responsible wine. And as we've seen during wine history, market always have the final word. More sustainable wine, more responsible wine, why? First of all, because um, I see that the perception of wine has changed. It was a simple consumption product or a social st status marker. And those through wines, people want to go back to nature Want to um, want to feel the environmental respect. Uh, want to feel that they're more eco-friendly. So we we came we we know uh, have a more responsible consumption because people want to be part, want to be involved in this environmental transition. It's a notion of personal involvement that we can observe today. Why more sustainable, more responsible? because greener means reaching a higher price. And many extensive studies have uh, highlighted that fact. The first one was uh, produced by Lee Stash, Master of Wine and Dr. Angelo Camillo from the Sonoma University. And uh, they studied uh, the, in 50 different states in the US, they asked uh, more than a thousand consumers and a very significant proportion of them declared that they were ready to pay far more for organic or biodynamic wines. Then Wine Intelligence in 2020 did uh, another very extended study, and this time it concerned France, Sweden, Canada, the US, with again thousands of consumers. And 70% uh, of them were able saying that sustainability was a purchasing criteria and millennials were ready to pay up to five US dollars more if the wines were more sustainable. So wine Dynata in 2021 did the same on French consumers and 57% were ready to pay more when certified organic. So there is a readiness to pay more for sustainable wines. There's also a notion of profitability. Um, greener potentially means more, more profitable. Um, an, another study produced by the French National Institute of Statistics and Economic Studies, along with Serre France, in 2017 showed that, and you can see that on the curve on top, that uh, the, um, the gross operating profit is higher when um, agriculture is organic compared to conventional. Same for the uh, net average results in Euro per hectare per agricultural uh, unit. And you can see that the, the curve is, uh, is, uh, is much uh, is significantly higher when farm organic raises than conventional. Greener, more profitable, for Forbes International also uh, produced a study in 2018, and that one was international. And it showed that small and medium-sized wineries, the more they are sustainable, the more they are profitable. So there's really a notion of profitability linked to responsibility. Last but not least, because we know that it's extremely important, greener means critique critics endorsements. Um, we, we had two researchers, one from Ketch uh, called Olivier Jargo and another from UCLA uh, called Magali Delmas who researched 
on wine scores. Uh, the, the first uh, results were published in 2016. Um, it was the result of an analysis covering 74,000 scores coming from the wine spectator, wine enthusiast, and wine advocates. And it showed that uh, the scores were on average uh, 4.1% higher when the wines were organic or biodynamic. They produced the same uh, with uh, French publications, French critics in 2021, and this time analyzing 128,000 scores from uh, Betan and the Sauve, Goemio, etc. And, and the, the, the results were even higher, was uh, plus 6.2% when organic and plus 5.6% when biodynamic. So how can we more, be more sustainable, more responsible? Obviously, there's many, many ways to do that, and I won't summarize everything in this uh, presentation, but it concerns the viticultural approach, soil management, pest and weed management, uh, water management, and then we will speak about dry, uh, dry farming later on. Uh, in the winery, uh, retaining uh, uh, the, the fermentation carbon dioxide, uh, use it, being more responsible in terms of water, um, uh, using cleaner energy, recycling, etc. More sustainable, more responsible is also and is a lot about packaging and uh, and transport. Um, on on the left, uh, you you see the carbon footprint of the Californian wine industry uh, that was calculated in 2011, which shows that packaging and transport uh, represents 51 percent of the carbon footprint of the Californian industry. Uh, Bordeaux did the same and calculated this carbon footprint and, uh, and the, the, the results were very similar with, uh, with uh, the, the transport and packaging waiting a lot. Uh, so again, lots of solution. Lighter glass is a very important one. Uh, with a light bottle, it can be minus 15% in terms of carbon footprint. Uh, cock forest. Uh, new packaging and innovation, recycling, and in terms of transport, going maritime or electric. Um, a focus on bulk uh, shipping uh, is probably important. If we take a step back and think about the past, well, uh, wine was transported in casks. Uh, so no, it might sound industrial, but we have the means to protect wine. And it's, it's obviously much more environmental to go that way. And also uh, think about the export strategy and, uh, and think about th these wineries will export to faraway uh, destinations why they could potentially opt for more local uh, strategies and this would make a big change. Marketing, obviously, uh, was storytelling, labeling. Today, not tomorrow. This is very important. All the marketing studies show that you need to... Uh, at some point, you need to show that you're already acting and making a change today. Uh, using facts and figures, uh, it needs to, to be proven. Uh, favor in terms of, say, sustainable production approach, sustainable packaging, bulk wines again, local or less far away. It's very easy when you're either a wine merchant or a wine restaurant to decide to uh, uh, show and, and sell mostly local or wines coming from less far away, and education uh, in the vineyards and wineries, in restaurants, in wine shops, in school, and through conferences as we're doing today. I also believe that the wines of tomorrow will be fresher. Um, it might sound paradoxical, but it's pretty obvious that we have heat today, and when you have it, when you have ripeness, when you come back from what I would call this concentration era, the search for concentrations that we lived in the 90s and the early 2000s, then there's a search for freshness. The market, the demand is evolving also in, demand, in reaction to climate change. Um, we look for purity and freshness versus concentration. Alcohol levels are becoming a problem. And if you think about... Uh, alcohol levels a few decades ago, it was a marker of quality to have a higher alcohol. And nowadays you're looking at the label and you're thinking, okay, this is 14 or 15, not sure I will pick that wine. Same for acidity. Um, wines were often said to be too 
acidic in the past, and nowadays I believe that acidity, acidity is becoming a new ally. Fresher, many ways to produce fresher wines. Vegetal material, uh, picking rootstocks or science uh, that have uh, um, a slower maturation, canopy management, berry protection, and then in, in the old world, we should look at what's going on in the new world because they're, they're facing these problems for longer than us. And, and they use uh, cowling clay, they use netting, they, they, they're experimenting much more things than we do. Uh, soil management, dry farming. Uh, if, if you think about certain uh, wineries in warm places, such as I'm thinking about Frog's Leap, in the Napa Valley, Frog's Lip is dry farmed and it's producing wine with low alcohol. Uh, so it's not because you give more water to your plants that you produce more elegant wines. And might sound very basic, but harvesting earlier and then extracting less uh, can work as well. Uh, if, if you look at the Swartland that I mentioned earlier, in the Swartland, that's what they're doing. They're uh, harvesting much earlier uh, they don't care about phenolic ripeness and then all this debate around phenolic ripeness. And then they, they go for infusion in terms of uh, extraction and the wines are extremely elegant and acclaimed all around the world. In the winery, not sure that reverse osmosis or spinning cones uh, are extremely sustainable, uh, but we could think about adding water, uh, which uh, is already uh, allowed in certain countries and is probably less industrial. We can use microorganism and then especially uh, some yeast uh, who produce less alcohol or uh, retain more acidity and again softer extraction and maybe aging with less new oak or less toasted oak which sometimes render the wines heavier. I believe that there will be also more diversity uh, simply because we, we, we have to go that way. Uh, we, we have to use vegetal material, we have to use grape varieties and, and the diversity of grape varieties. Uh, we are already exploring new terroir. Uh, there's uh, more and more wineries going for less oak, less extraction, which is more potential bottled personalities. And we have lots of solutions when it comes to producing wine with uh, a softer aging, wine gloves, amphoras, concrete, etc. More diversity, yes, but while maintaining the identity, we have the chance to have according to OIV, 6,000 Vitis vinifera grape varieties. And we have the grapes in the right places. We have Cabernet in, in the two Cabernet in Bordeaux. We have Assyrtico in Greece. We have Corvina Veronese in Veneto, Graziano in Rioja. All these grapes retain good acidity and freshness. Uh, but the first thing we should do, and I'm thinking about Merlot in certain places, when it comes to Bordeaux, we should start by replanting grapes on the white soil when we know where they should be planted. Less, more expensive, but better. That's also my belief. Transition, adaptation has a cost. Uh, knowledge must be shared and taught. We need to educate the future professionals and the consumers. We need to change behavior. We need to be ready to pay more for less but better. I think you were mentioning price and you were mentioning that German, price, uh, German wines are too cheap. I completely agree with that. There's a price for change. There's a price for being responsible and we need to shape the future consumers and to make sure they're ready to pay more so that the producers have enough means to be more responsible. And I will finish saying that wines of tomorrow or back to the past, that's really a question because we're speaking about new recipes to prepare the future, but actually I believe that innovation and tradition are closely linked. Diversity used to be the case in the past. Biodiversity, well, we changed every, everything because of the industrial revolution. Fresher, the wines were fresher in the past. We had polyculture in many places, bulk shipping, it was more local. It was often sustainable and far less waste. So the good news is that we don't have to reinvent everything. Many old recipes are back on the table. Thank you for your attention. So
Dear Jeremy, yes. thank you very much for this very interesting um, insight you gave us to your work, to your thinkings. Back My to pleasure. the future <laughs> is a little yeah. bit uh, what I felt that came out of it. And education is important and also awareness of the consumers about the products. Uh, the wine industry is giving them, the, they give them much fun, I think, um, and good things for life. And th this is, I think, a very positive uh, thing we should uh, think about. We also have the possibility now to ask you several questions. Uh, the microphone is again open here for the small public we have from the great wine capitals. We are here in Mainz in the Frankfurter Hof, just for those who came uh, to see us via, via the live stream. And we have delegates here from all the European great wine capitals and from uh, the United States, Napa Valley. So please uh, feel free to ask Jeremy Kukieman as long as his microphones are open. I look into the audience and there's one question. Jacques Florence from Bordeaux is asking. Bonjour Jacques. Hello Jeremy. How do you feel? Um, I feel much, much better. Okay, great. Uh, my question is, what about tourism? Uh, what's the link between what you say perfectly, but uh, our topic here is wine tourism, and uh, uh, how could you do, define the link between the, what you say and tourism? Thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's a very good point, and sorry, I, I forgot to put on my slide on marketing. Uh, wine tourism is one of the most important tool, important tool, and obviously that's the best way we can bring the people on, on sites. And, and, and show them how important it is to be more responsible and then and how you can produce this fresher and more responsible wine. So yeah, yeah. So sorry about this. Uh, uh, probably the, the, the COVID effect, but that's very obvious and I should have, uh, I've, I've put that uh, in, uh, in bold on, on the slide. Okay. So, Our subject, wine tourism, involving wine tourism in the world is important, as we hear. Are there any other questions from the audience? I look. If seems not... I, seems I was crystal clear. At least uh, I hope I gave you hope and, uh, yeah, a bit of, a bit of sun. Yeah, uh, we, we are happy. We have sun outside. <laughs> But uh, yes, you really, I think, gave us hope and positive ideas and thinkings. And we here will now make a short pause um, and uh, we will come back to this conference um, in 15 minutes. So the audience that is uh, looking at us uh, from the screens, we will be back at 11.15 with very... Uh, other way of maybe considering uh, the development of climate and changings. And we will meet uh, Professor Hans Rainer Schulz from the University of Geisenheim at 11.15 here in this conference. So thank you for being with us, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you to the audience. And we'll meet each other at 11.15 again. Thank you. And, thank and you. enjoy the rest of the journey. And, and I'll be there next time. I promise. Yeah, we are happy, more than happy if this happens. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, welcome, bienvenue, willkommen in the Frankfurter Hof, in the heart of the old town of Mainz. We are here and on the occasion of the Great Wine Capital Annual Conference 2021. And um, we already had a very um, good morning until now. We heard from Monika Reule, um, the CEO of the German Wine Institute, um, about research, uh, what the German Wine Institute does, or also on wine tourism, and about solutions they found in the challenging times of COVID-19 infection and uh, people not traveling neither to Germany nor abroad. 
Then we heard from Jeremy Cookieman, director of Catch Business School in Bordeaux. He um, shared with us his uh, positive thinkings about uh, the challenges of climate change and what this will do uh, to the wine market and uh, yeah maybe uh, wines uh, of tomorrow, how they will be, where they will come from, and what the producers uh, should do. Those who could not attend because they are in different time zones, I think about our colleagues from Argentina, um, Australia, Chile, um, they will be able to see uh, this on our conference website later on, so we will put everything what we see this morning also on the website. But now we are live here from the Frankfurter Hof and I would like to introduce and say a warm welcome to Professor Dr. Hans Rainer Schulz. Yeah, talking about him is a little bit like carrying owls to Athens in the wine sphere. But anyhow, many of us in the network, uh, they know him and we remember his speech he did to us to the day two years ago in Bordeaux uh, in the Cité du Vin. Um, Hans Rainer Schulz studied viticulture and enology and then plant biology and horticulture at the University of California, Davis, in the US. And um, he also uh, went as a postdoc to the Ecole Nationale Supérieure Agronomique in Montpellier in France. In 1995, he became head of the Department of Viticulture at the Research Institute in Geisenheim, that is just on the other side of the Rhine River, about 20 kilometers away from Mainz, and even if it's in the Rheingau, we consider it as our university of wine, the leading one of, uh, I would say, Germany. So today, he is the director, uh, and um, he's now the president also of this Hochschule Geisenheim University since 2013. So Hans Rainer Schulz is also a member of the scientific advisory board of the Institute de Sciences de la Vigne et du Vin at the University of Bordeaux. And um, yeah, to other, many, many other institutions also in um, the Douro Valley in Portugal. So you see, he's already very much connected and linked to our great wine capital global network. So I don't want to talk about his awards and scholarships. They are so numerous, um, but um, we are very happy now to hear from him about sustainability and climate change in viticulture global challenges and possibilities. And at the end, we will also be able to ask questions, what we will hear about. So, um, Professor Schulz, you will now share your presentation with us. Maybe you want to say hello to the audience before, and then we will see what you prepared and will share with us. Thank you. Yes, uh, so, yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, hello, everybody out there. I hope... Uh, Everybody is well after the pandemic uh, kind of moved this event uh, for, for one year. Um, I'm going to share the, um, the screen and um, hopefully you can see, um, you can see and hear everything. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, an, an idea, um, what, what I was actually asked to, to do. Um, um, just a second, sorry. The presentation is, sorry. Um, yeah, technology, you know, sorry. So, yeah, hopefully you can see now. So, um, uh, as was already introduced um, where uh, are we located and um, where is mines located so it's just as already previously was said we're just across the river so uh, maximum half an hour drive so it's not really very separate um, what I was asked to do today was actually um, give an impulse to show you what is in fact the position uh, of the OIV as an international organization of uh, 
uh, Vine and Wine on the issue. Uh, what is the uh, newest, actually, relationship to the uh, uh, United Nations uh, climate report, which was issued just um, uh, a little bit more than a month ago. And so, uh, what kind of a relationship do we have uh, to climate change as a larger um, topic? And one thing is that the 50 degree latitude north is just running right through the town of Geisenheim, uh, which used to be the northern limit of uh, viticulture, as it was termed, say, like 70 years ago. So, um, as I was asked to underline the position of the OIV, but also of the what is called the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, which is actually producing the assessments on, um, on the... For, you know, the projections uh, for the future in terms of um, climate development. So I'll give you some ideas about this, um, what is actually key to that globally, uh, with relation, of course, to uh, grapes and wine, and give you also some inconvenient realities, because we ha need to look at a little bit beyond viticulture if you really want to understand what is, what is actually at stake. Uh, a little bit of very um, few uh, resulting regional trends, trying to give you some idea about what is actually predicted and what is actually already observed. And then a little piece on soils, because that's one of the big issues concerning uh, agriculture in general and viticulture in particular, and maybe other challenges we can discuss later on. Um, yeah. What are we doing as uh, mankind? Actually, we're running business as usual. Uh, business as usual brought us to where we are right now. And um, I just wanted to give you an example. Um, I wrote this review 21 years ago. It was published in 2000. And um, at the time, I was using a business as usual scenario, as you can see here on the right side. Um, because it was written in 2000, this was the CO2 concentration uh, at that time. And um, this is a business as usual um, uh, scenario. And uh, if you can see, if you just take what we have today, 2021, it's exactly what was predicted 21 years ago as business as usual. So it is reality. And it's not really changing that much. Not even COVID changed a lot. And at the time, one of the, one of the simpler things uh, deductible was, in fact, uh, what Jeremy uh, Kickerman was uh, referring to is uh, probably uh, what kind of varieties are we going to use in the future. So at that time, so 21 years ago, the normal ordinary bracket of temperature um, summation, the so-called Iglin index, would have predicted for Germany these type of varieties, exactly what we actually were cultivating for hundreds of years. Um, the most recent 10 years before the report was written, um, already there was some climate development which actually would have at the time suggested, well, oh, maybe we can actually grow Cabernet Franc or Malo. You know, a little bit speculative at the time. And just to give you an idea, um, on what kind of relationship we are right now, this was the year 2018, completely off scale. So it just shows you how much has already changed over the last 21 plus, maybe 20 plus years. So give you some facts. In agriculture, one of the greatest achievements actually of the last 70 years is that food production has largely kept up with demand. Food prices are at an all-time low, and we need to look uh, outside from the box, outside of viticulture. Uh, improved food security and efficient production at, over that period freed up labor for other businesses, which drove economic development. But the majority of the world's poor live in agricultural communities. There's about 2.5 billion people in poor countries live directly from the food and agricultural sector. And the state is 850 million people are hungry, 2 billion are malnourished, and 2.5 billion are actually overweight. 
So the food system is completely out of balance. And cheap food is expensive. Now, we'll come to this back again in terms of viticultural uh, strategies. Because it pressurizes agriculture ever more and makes a reasonable use of resources almost impossible, and we all probably agree that we need a reasonable use of resources in the future. The food system on the planet is the primary cause of biodiversity loss, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, waste, loss of land, social inequity, and it really the cost of environmental impact, and we have so-called 22 negative impacts, and those points raised above, plus climate change, amounts to about 4.7 trillion euros a year. This doesn't even include uh, the health sector. Now, the food system contributes about, say, 20 to 30 percent of the global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And that means we talk about CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. And what we call um, an E behind the CO2 is what we call CO2 equivalence. We just recalculate the nitrous oxide or the methane as major greenhouse gases into CO2 equivalence. So we had one, actually one unit. Um, of this, agriculture and land cover changes contrib contributed about 8 to 15 billion tons, which means roughly 80%. So, um, yet the soils we have in agriculture, they should have a sequestration potential. So taking up greenhouse gas emissions instead of releasing them by about 3 billion tons a year, but they are not. Now, just to give you an idea about the setting, Bitcoin trading of one year has the same energy consumption as New Zealand or Chile. And this is going behind the scenes. And if we all, click at a website, we generate about 6.8 grams of CO2 equivalent of emissions. Hardly anybody ever, hardly um, anybody is talking about this. So wine is, or we are not an island, and there's more at stake than just the wine industry. I just have to uh, refer. So the wine industry could be a role model, but for this, actually, we need a movement and not singular, albeit increasing activities. And um, quoting Jeremy Kuckerman uh, for his book, announcing major predictions should be done with caution. I agree. And the great vineyard sites were chosen for a combination of factors, one of which is climate. Only this factor has changed. I don't agree. And Vitus vinifer is a very resilient plant with the ability to adapt. I partially agree. Uh, agree. But I'll come back to this later. And varieties, in the fact, is the least of our problems. Um, setting the scene again, because we are currently in Europe under the conditions that the European Union Green Deal has set. So it has set the goal to reduce uh, uh, the use of chemical plant protection uh, products by 50% until 2030, to reduce the use of fertilizer by a minimum of 20%, to reduce nutrient losses by a minimum of 50%, to implement the biodiversity strategy, which has been released in 2019 and achieved 25% organic agriculture by 2030. And Europe wants to be climate neutral by 2050. These are the settings also with respect to what is going to be happening for the wine industry. So let's see what kind of regional trends that we are having. And I've shown this, uh, was already mentioned two years ago when it was uh, uh, live in Bordeaux uh, for the wine capitals, what is actually the climate development. And I used Geisenheim as a surrogate for mines. So what you can see since about 1980, temperature uh, within the vegetation period has increased. It also has increased Geneva, Lausanne, the Adelaide Hills as a surrogate for Adelaide as a wine capital. Bilbao, Bordeaux, Santiago, Valparaiso, Napa Valley or San Francisco, Verona, Porto, Mendoza. You can all, you can see there's, uh, since about 1980, all of them have the same development, uh, some a little bit faster than others, but actually it's a similar um, development irrespective of where you are on the planet. And just to give you an idea about 2018, 
um, to 18 for us who were moving way, way, way away from the normal uh, baseline. So this is what an exceptional year, but it's also the year which is predicted to be normal by the year 2050 for us. And you can equally deduct that for other areas, it would be equally moving upwards. What are the consequences? And as I was asked to reflect to the sixth assessment report, which has been released in August, as I said, this is the newest climate uh, United Nations report. I show you the regional fact sheets for Europe, Africa, Australia, and the United States. Now for Europe, I hope you can read it. Uh, temperature will rise in all European areas, nothing very um, exceptional to this, but it will rise exceeding the global mean temperature changes. And um, it can only be explained if we uh, incorporate uh, the uh, human factors. So it's not any more a variability which might be related to some state of the planet. So um, in part, the, the development we observed since 1980 was also because we cleaned up the atmosphere. We removed aerosol uh, pollution um, which actually reduced temperatures between the Second World War and approximately 1980, what we call the global dimming period. And we have a movement of uh, um, precipitation decrease, meaning drought, away from the Mediterranean to more northern countries. So I'll just give you an example. I want to give you examples of observations we already made and what is predicted by the IPCC report. Now, if we take um, Western and Central Europe, which would be the triangle here, uh, what is predicted for that? And it used to be a projected increase in pluvial flooding, which means flooding which is actually uh, caused by rainfall. Huh? And if you look at the, the, the news report, um, before the increase of 2 degrees centigrade, we have extremely high confidence that this will happen at a much more frequent rate. Do we observe something like this? Now, this you probably had seen on the news is from the um, July of this year, what we call the R Valley catastrophe. And we had a high precipitation um, circulation in Central Europe, right on the corner between Luxembourg um, and Belgium and Germany. And what we had in the R Valley was 182 deaths, 800 injured, 42,000 people without shelter, 3,000 enterprises destroyed, 95% of all viticultural operations in winery, actually. And a study of the German Weather Service has concluded that the likelihood of this flood in the same spot, which used to be 500 years, every 500 years, depending on the model, oh, sorry, depending on the model you're using, is in the best case repeating itself every 400 years, and in the worst case, every 55 years in the future, meeting at the same spot, not somewhere else. Now, this risk in part, and if you have talked about tourism this morning, this risk in part is also a risk because of the problem of land use changes. I just wanted to give you an idea. This is Geisenheim in 1952, and this is Geisenheim structured in, 2000, in the, um, 2012. What you can see is basically the, the structure of the landscape has completely changed. The small parcels have vanished, and largely for economic reasons. We have increased the surface area. We have removed basically trees. You know, the number of trees was 624, and it's now 180. So the structure of landscape also, which had to be a different, made a difference for uh, tourism, in my opinion, has completely changed. And this changing in structure, this changing in landscape, also, con also contributes to changes in climate uh, issues. And our economic views have led us to ignore this type of nature because we actually uh, have the economic um, background as a big um, uh, number one priority. And if you look at the Mediterranean, uh, forecast. So go down a little bit south. We can see that uh, there is an increase the danger of aridity and uh, fire weather conditions at a global warming of predicted two degrees centigrade. And the largest output of this is if you go to the right side, this is a precipitation index, so meaning how much rainfall do you have. 
and it, it was deviating into that brown zone, you, the predictions by a two degree warming would be that we have less than 20, maybe even 30% um, uh, 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 rainfall, uh, which it can be a catastrophe unless you um, create the infrastructure for irrigation. Go to Africa. There is, of course, uh, viticulture in Africa. Now, the surface temperature increase for Africa and the fact sheet of the IPCC has generally been more increase in temperature in Africa than on the global average. And the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events, as we've just seen for uh, Europe, are also projected to increase almost everywhere. But if you go to, vit to viticulture, one of the uh, big issues is if you can see the temperature increase from it will be largest in northern Africa and also in the southern part where we have grape grown. And if you look at the annual and total precipitation rate, so rainfall, there isn't just a definite de decrease uh, in rainfall projected specifically for the regions around the Cape. So we can deduct from this already that there's some substantial changes to be expected. If you go to the other side of the globe, to the Northern American fact sheet, um, what you can see here, there are some common changes predicted for the American continent, but others show distinct regional patterns. And I will show you an example for this. Now, one of the things which you can see that for the Northern part of uh, uh, the American continent, the increase in temperature is much more predicted, much more pronounced than for the southern part. And actually, we saw this this year already, because in June, Canada had and, and British Columbia had some temperatures which were close to 43 degrees, and actually some of the mussels, um, some of the seafood actually was just cooked alive. And if you look at some prediction in terms of precipitation, and you go to the West Coast, yeah, you can see the same as we were seeing for Africa. We have a decrease in precipitation rate. But if you go to the East Coast, in fact, the predictions say, um, well, there's going to be an increase. So a regional difference. Now, the fact is, or the question is, is that true? And this is just an, I'll uh, give you an idea of what happened this year at, uh, in the U.S. This is the so-called U.S. drought monitor. And by the 24th of August, the more red, the more drought you're having. So the entire Western part is actually stricken by drought. And by the 24th of August, 4,500 out of 6,000 producers actually were cut off from irrigation. In other parts of the world, you see also a decrease in groundwater. But this is a much, much more severe condition. And this is uh, from October 5th. So the situation was not relieved uh, um, very recently, only the last weekend. And the last weekend we had over, over 200 millimeters of rainfall in Napa and Sonoma around in, causing flooding. You see, it's repeating itself. This pattern is not only present in Europe, this pattern is also present in the Mediterranean, but also in uh, the US. And the challenges, this is out of Wine Business International from the 24th of September. The challenge, they said, is, there is no water. And look at the bottom line. Yeah? Another indication of how desperate California is for water, Marine County water officials are competing with Muhammad bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, to purchase three portable desalination plants. Now, Blunt reality and not wishful thinking. Now, looking at the water relation, um, we can actually analyze and see whether the U.S. prediction are anywhere near what we're actually seeing. Now, the relationship of precipitation to potential evapotranspiration is decisive for the trends in water relations of a given region, which means if you have a value between precipitation and evapotranspiration, that's as much water as is used, if you have a value of one, it's balanced, okay? If you have a, war, uh, value, um, a value of larger one, then the region is energy limited. And if you have a value smaller than one, the region is water limited. So basically, it's a relationship what comes down and what co goes up. 
just for the uh, to give you an idea what happened already over the past because the prediction is one thing and as Jeremy Quickerman said you have to take those with caution but look at this this is Lodi in California a little bit inwards from the coast basically you have no almost no changes over the last 50 60 years a little bit of a change in a summer or winter rainfall but nothing in evapotranspiration but if you look at Oakville in the Napa Valley, you have a clear, a very clear signal of decreases in precipitation with no increase in evapotranspiration. If you go to Geisenheim, you can see fluctuations, but you have a trend, a clear trend to a decrease. And this decrease has nothing to do with precipitation as in the other areas. But it has to do with an increase in uh, evapotranspiration because it gets warmer, more water is actually evaporating. If you look at Bordeaux, you have the same thing. It goes from actually an energy limited area because there's much more rainfall than Geisenheim to an, a water limited area. Very striking is uh, these cycles. And this is not really due to precipitation changes. This is due to evapotranspiration changes. Now, if you go to the east coast of the United States, you go to the Finger Lakes, you can see the inverse, actually exactly as predicted by the IPCC. And this in, uh, inverse relationship is because they have more summer rainfall and nothing else changed. So just to give you these ideas and looking at regional differences, and if you look at South America, the mean temperature very likely increased already but the really big difference is in terms of water. And let look at the, the uh, annual precipitation again. So now if you are in Chile, right? If you are in Chile, the prediction is you have a really strong decrease in rainfall. If you are on the other side of the Andes, you have a relatively strong, or will have a, a relatively strong increase in precipitation. So it's the same Southern American larger region, but with distinctly different developments. Similar to Australia, has warmed much more than on the global average, and heat extremes have increased, as we have seen in the news, and heavy rainfall and river floods are projected to increase because that's an automatic um, deduction from uh, larger heat loads. Um, and one thing is uh, the Tasmanian Sea has been actually um, singled out as one of the regions which is warming up the most, affecting, of course, also viticulture in the Tasmanian island. But if you look at precipitation again on this thing, you can see there's one area specifically in Western Australia, Margaret River, which will be more uh, drought um, affected than others. So soils at the end give you a little bit, just a, a short uh, um, status quo on soils. It's a key to sustainability. It's our most valuable resource because soils store about 1,500 1, to 2,500 billion tons of carbon. This is more than the atmosphere contains in all plants on land. And every year we lose a lot of this due to erosion and erosion probably will increase. And this is also a viticultural perspective. And this initiative, which actually was launched um, after the P uh, Paris Climate Summit, um, was aiming at a four per thousand, which means if we could increase carbon stored in the soil by 0.4% per year, we can largely balance the greenhouse gas emissions we are launching every year. But that's not an easy enterprise because we need to map the carbon storage capacity of agriculture, but of course of vineyard soil also. Now, if we could achieve a 1% increase of organic material in the soil, that is equivalent to 21 tons of carbon. Now, there are initiatives in California and Australia where to actually support agriculture, pay money to agriculture, that they will store carbon in the soil. The additional effect, positive effect is if you have an increase in carbon in the soil, you can also store more water. And the drought issue is a big one, which would mean 1% increase in carbon stores 167,000 liters 
more water per hectare. So we need a map like this. France has already a map like this, and we need to have create incentives for agriculture. But one of the problems we are observing, we have a hundred, more than a hundred year uh, database of soil temperatures in Gaza, not air temperatures, soil temperature. Now this is a change in one meter soil depth over the last hundred years in fall. And this is the change in summer. And since about 1980, we have a, a registered a four to 4.5 degrees centigrade increase in temperature in the soil. This is much more uh, relevant than the increase we've observed, observed in the air. So, um, and this change in temperature will largely offset any efforts to store carbon if we don't take that in consideration. And that just shows how difficult it is. And to finish up, how can we actually turn vineyard soil in greenhouse gas sinks? And this is one of the very rare examples. It's coming from a, a California vineyard where they actually balanced or you know, did a, a balance on this. And they had two systems, a vineyard with minimum tillage and a cover crop. Uh, they used dwarf barley. And the system, which is more like the European system, um, tillage one in autumn, one in spring, plus mulch, plus a cover crop, also with a cover crop called dwarf barley. Now, if the sign is negative, which that means that that vineyard is taking up carbon. If the sign is positive, that vineyard is taking up carbon or carbon equivalent, okay? Now, nitrous oxide, methane, and the fuel carbon you're using with a tractor have all been incorporated. Now, this system to the left, uh, to make it short, gives you a net greenhouse potential, which is negative, which is close to one ton of carbon equivalents be capable to be stored in the soil. Now, this on the right is not negative. It will additionally emit carbon equivalents. And the difference between those two is larger than a ton per hectare. Now, but if you look at the yield they have, the yield here is much smaller than that, despite the fact that they both were nine times irrigated because, of course, you have a cover crop. Now, it just shows you what we need is a true cost accounting approach because that difference actually needs to be uh, substituted by the price. So we need prices for agricultural commodities and also for wine, which will incorporate the effects on the environment. And that's a so-called true cost accounting. And it's extremely important to put this up for all agricultural commodities. So to summarize this, with true cost, we are back to economics, which I said is a problem. And economics at the current state is not helpful for the planet. And the wine industry needs a global initiative. There are some existing like the Porto Protocol, Sustainable Wine Table, International Wineries of Climate Action, but we need a much more concerted action. So how about our reaction? I want to leave that with the, with the audience. And um, to sum it up, we need a much more unified strategy. And the OIV can only be of limited help because it's such a diverse community. And um, it's very difficult to move forward documents which actually may be seen as guidelines or regulatory documents uh, in any of these areas. And as we just uh, saw, it makes a difference whether I am in South Africa, whether I am in San Francisco, whether I'm on the East Coast, or whether I'm in Mainz or Germany or Bordeaux or anywhere on this planet, what kind of strategy I need to develop. And with this, thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm here for any further questions if you have. So... Thank you very, very much, I think, for this interesting insight of uh, research and uh, all the results you can uh, deduct from this. And I think it was also very interesting that we did not look only on uh, viticulture, but on agriculture and on uh, every, all the effects, climate change, global warming, and uh, everything has on not our industries only, 
but on our life in the future, I would say, if not for us, but for future generations, it's extremely important to think about all these things. So I think thank you uh, very much from the audience here. I don't know if you could hear our applause, but it was uh, very loud. And um, yeah, you invited us to uh, talk to you. And uh, we have a microphone open, so um, please, if there are questions, um, Hans Rainer Schulz is ready uh, to answer or to maybe precise anything. I don't know what is of interest from the audience. It's always a little bit difficult to ask the first question. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Um, I look because I'm light is bright. Ah, there is Lots one. Of information yeah. in, in yeah. just a short yeah. We we also yes we have to digest uh, all the information <laughs> and we are not all used to this uh, scientific approach of the things with the numbers and the different things. But we have uh, Jacques Olivier Pesma. He's here. Yes, good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it was very interesting. You mentioned different things regarding the climate change and actually its impact and, and, and the evolution. Uh, you didn't mention or didn't talk about uh, potential new wine region appearing, you know, and this as being an opportunity, actually. What is your view on that? I mean, um um, of course, I couldn't put. They, they asked me to give me 20 to maximum 30 minute Im impulse on the problems. Of course, we cannot elaborate um, on this. But in fact, the, the, when you remember the first slide, and um, I said I, I showed you the 50 degree latitude, which used to be the northern limit. Now we are currently at the 57.7 degree latitude. We are in Sweden. We are in Norway. Our, and of course, it's also moving on the southern hemisphere. Of course, there are new developments, new wine regions which can be explored, no doubt about this. The map, the wine map has changed already substantially. Um, in the South American continent, going a little bit more further south to Patagonia and so forth. These observations on England the developments, even in Canada, um, yeah, uh, there are opportunities, of course, to if you look at the wine industry to to uh, conquer, reconquer new areas. But at the same time, of course, we need to be aware of the fact that we may be potentially losing some areas in the future, at least um, to wine production. If you just look at the amount of water you need for irrigation, in some areas it would be a struggle. Um, to uh, the luxury product of wine as compared to agricultural food production. And then, of course, one will reflect, am I going to invest a liter of water into wine irrigation or am I going to invest a liter of water into the production of vegetables, uh, potatoes or whatever? So we were going to face this. It's not going to be tomorrow, but it will be within the next 30 to 50 years now. So, thank you. Yeah, so I look to my audience. Are there any other questions or just a few words or thinkings you would like to share with us? No? Okay. So unfortunately, people. Ah, Lydie? No, no, sorry. Uh, unfortunately, people that are seeing us on screen, uh, they cannot ask us because we thought it's too complicated uh, chatting with people and discussing. Cus discussing. But um, anyhow, you will have this uh, very interesting information on our website of the Congress after the Congress. And um, I think. Hans Rainer Schulz will be with us tonight for the gala event. He will be maybe a little bit late because he has many, many duties at his university. Today it's a very special day for Geisenheim University. And uh, yeah, I'm, I have to apologize not being there in in person, but 
there was a conflict of uh, timing. We have our, what we call the, the scientific annual scientific board meeting yesterday and today. And that is uh, also um, timed a year in advance. And so it was colliding. And uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be, I couldn't make the half an hour trip to Mainz, but I will be this evening. So maybe yeah. the, if you have some more questions, we can talk about this this evening. Yeah. So I think this is, will be a very good opportunity and we thank you again for joining us even though you had this uh, time uh, consuming things to do oh. in your normal Pleasure. professional life and we will be very happy but there is one more question from Catherine Le Parmentier. Catherine. Hi, no, thank you Elke. It's not a question, it's just a comment uh, for you Hans. Um, I have had been very impressed by your presentation in Bordeaux two years ago and I'm I'm glad to say that uh, yours this morning also impressed me. So thank you very much for sharing these insights with us and with the Great Wayne Capitals. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So looking forward to see you this afternoon, this uh, evening. Thank you. So again, thank you for this discussion and thank you, Monica Reule, Jeremy Kukieman. Hans Reiner Schulz for sharing your knowledge with us about the latest trends in the wine industries, but not restricted to these industries. And to share this with us here, but also with the world. And I thank you, the audience, uh, for being with us this morning. I wish you all a pleasant day, and we will end this day as Great Wine Capitals Global Network with our gala event 2021 this evening from 7 uh, in the evening, everybody will uh, be able to follow us with a live stream and will see us what we do on screen when we uh, will celebrate wine culture. And the motto will then uh, come to life, we hope. So we will award tonight our best of wine tourism winners from Mainz and Rheinhessen and those around the globe. So you should be curious and join us. And thank you again and have a nice day. Thank you.